Our next speaker means that whether you are building an app or working with marketing, what you do or, or perhaps should do is create empathy. Matt Hackett is co-founder and CTO at Beam, and he will explain the tension between empathy and scale, as we are entering a new era when uh, empathy moments can happen a lot more often than today. And I just... I just have to tell you what you just told me, Matt, this morning, because when Matt came down in the elevator, there were fans waiting for him and wanted to take a selfie with you. That's so amazing. <laughs> uh, welcome, Matt Hackett. If your memory serves you well, we were going to meet again and wait. So I'm going to unpack all my that was the very slow version of the theme song for Absolutely Fabulous, which I now has a different Swedish name that I don't know. But <laughs> um, All right, so I'm going to talk about this idea of scale and empathy and how these two are a bit in tension and how video presents a potential for us to sort of get beyond that tension. Um, but before I do that, I want to go back to January 2011. So January 2011 was a pretty exciting time on the internet and in the world. Uh, you may or may not remember, but that was the beginning of what would become uh, the Arab Spring, as we call it. But really, at the time, it was just these protests in Egypt that were spurred by social media and really gaining an incredible amount of momentum. And at that time, I was the VP of Engineering at Tumblr. And a lot of the social networks were hearing from NGOs and from other groups that were concerned about these protests that there was the real potential for the Egyptian government to turn off the internet in Egypt uh, as a sort of last ditch effort to get rid of the, the revolution and to get rid of these protests. And so the Committee to Protect Journalists, a few other NGOs had been talking with networks like ourselves about this potential. And when they started you know, sort of telling us that this might be something that could happen, that Egypt could fall off the internet. Uh, I opened a little window in my desktop in New York that was looking at all of our traffic coming from Egypt. And I just left it there in the corner for a few days. And most of the time that just scrolled super quickly past hundreds, thousands of requests a second, uh, you know, very typical sort of log file of traffic. And then towards the end of the month, uh, so Mubarak resigned at the beginning of February. And right before that happened, so one of the last days of January, that log file went from being just a flood to tick, 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 just a tiny bit of traffic. Uh, almost, everything for, uh, almost everything for traffic to social networks in Egypt uh, in the last few days was shut off completely. Uh, but there was this tiny, tiny bit of traffic coming through. And these logs are anonymized, so I you know, couldn't see exactly what user this was. Or, uh, but I was incredibly curious. What was this tiny, tiny bit of traffic uh, coming through amidst this revolution, amidst this uh, government attempt to really shut down access to social media? And I looked at the traffic, and I tried to figure out what it was. And what I saw is it was hitting the like button. If you've ever used Tumblr, it's that little heart. Uh, and they were, they were liking posts on a whole variety of blogs. And it really seemed to be, uh, given how little traffic it was, just, just one person who somehow still had internet access in Egypt. And what they were liking, I assumed was going to be protests. I assumed it was going to be uh, news related to all of these events. And I started to look at it. And what they were liking was a One Direction blog, a makeup tips blog, a cartoon princess blog, it became really clear to me that this one person who somehow still had internet access in Egypt was probably a 13-year-old girl. And as someone who makes social software, it was this moment that was just one of the most incredible in my career because I could imagine what it would be like to be a teenager, sort of not knowing what's going on and just being inside and wanting the world to be the same, wanting to sort of reach out and look at makeup blogs, look at all of these things that, that you sort of ordinarily looked at. And it was this moment of incredible empathy. Um, but what was strange about it, oh, this didn't go to the first slide there. Um, what was strange about it was that it wasn't about the protest. It was just this, I got this empathy because of this like button. And like I said, that's, as someone who creates social software, just this incredible, incredible moment. Um, 
But let's step back a little bit and talk about what this social software thing is. So I'm using this phrase social software as just this very generic way uh, to talk about the work that I do, but I also really think it includes all the work that people in this room do. Uh, if you are working with any of the social networks, if your brand or organization is talking on any of these platforms, you are using and building on social software. So I use that term generically, but uh, you know, really I think it includes all of you as well as the work that I do. And I think using these platforms, we have to ask ourselves this question, which can be a bit uncomfortable, but uh, why do we want, you know, why do we use these? And I think the biggest reason and the biggest distinguishing characteristic of social software over all other technology that's existed in sort of human history is its ability to scale, its ability to grow incredibly large, incredibly quickly. Um, there's really never been anything like it. So these eight networks here have existed only since the year 2000, so less than 16 years, and they all have over a billion users. And just to give you a point of comparison, the only other thing in the world that has a billion users is the Catholic Church, and they've been doing that for about two millennia. Android, in the lower corner here, got to a billion users in five and a half years. And that's a pretty remarkable difference. So, you know, we, we really use these platforms because of their ability to scale. Uh, but I think we also have to ask ourselves, you know, why, why do we want to build things at such scale? Why is scaling a good thing? And for me, the answer is very simple. Scale and social software's ability to scale uh, is important, and I'm interested in the work, and I think you all are probably interested for very similar reasons, because of the incredible capacity to create more empathy, the potential for software that grows so big to connect people across the world, the potential that is in moments like that moment of me really understanding what it would be like and being able to put myself in the position of a teenager in Egypt. So empathy is the reason that we build and use these platforms, I think. Of course, anyone who's built a website with a comment section or looked at a YouTube video and scrolled below the fold knows that often having more users, being able to scale, actually doesn't mean creating more empathy. In fact, it can be quite the opposite. More often than not, when these systems get larger, they actually reduce the sort of net empathy in the world. And let me give you a concrete example of that. It's very abstract. So let's go back to this like button. Uh, and let's go back a few years earlier. So in 2008, there was this sort of convergent evolution, as ha happens fairly often uh, with social software and with these platforms. And buttons like this, this is the like button from Tumblr, it's a heart, uh, it's a star on Twitter that's now also become a heart, it's a thumbs up on Facebook, it's an upvote on Dig or Reddit. Uh, this gesture is something that arrived on all these platforms pretty much at once. And we've gotten very used to it, and we've gotten used to seeing it on pretty much everything on the internet. But I think if you take a step back to 2008, it's actually a pretty noble and remarkable little thing. So this feature, this like, is meant to convey empathy. On a one-to-one -one level, it's meant to say, not only did I see what you shared, but I understand why you shared it. I can see from your perspective. I approve of it. I, I'm really like, I'm excited about it in a way that goes way beyond uh, what this gesture has become. And what this gesture has become, once it hits scale, is something a little bit less interesting. It's gotten a little number next to it. So it's not just a heart, but it's 10 likes or 100 likes. And human psychology dictates in a way that when something has that number next to it, we want to maximize it. We want to see that number go up. And we stop thinking about it as this one-to-one -one interaction. It's not so much me empathizing with you and expressing that using this heart. Uh, it's something that's much more a, an ego stroke. And when I put something out there, I insist that it get li gets likes. And that's what this phrase, smash the like, is. I don't know if that anyone's familiar with that. But you'll often see people post a, a YouTube video or, uh, or an Instagram and say, smash the like, meaning You've got to like this. Um, 
And there's, there's, so there's something that we've sort of lost here. And even worse than sort of losing the empathy in the gesture itself, I think this gesture has really failed because it's caused us to share less. And you know, I think anyone here who is using social media on behalf of a brand or an organization, you think about this every time you post. Is this going to get likes? Is this going to get thumbs up? Is this going to get approval? Uh, and if it's not, you're not going to post it because it doesn't look good. It looks kind of sad when something has no likes. So I think we've gotten even further from empathy in that because we're not even putting that thing out there that could possibly represent understanding that you could possibly see my perspective from because it, I'm not even willing to put it up. I think there's still a very exciting reason for optimism out there in the world. And I think that the potential for creating more empathy on these social platforms uh, is really going to have a moment of revival. And my optimism comes from this little guy. So this is a piece of hardware that's currently being used by about 20 to 30% of the world. By 2020, it's going to be used by 80% of the world. And you've probably not seen it blown up to this size because it's usually about a half centimeter. It's this CMOS sensor, the digital camera, uh, that's in your smartphone. And what excites me and gives me optimism is actually not necessarily the smartphone itself, uh, although there's, there's plenty that's, that's pretty spectacular in that. What I'm really excited about is this camera connected to a network chip. Because this network camera in the hands of 80% of the world means that 80% of the world can share uh, not you know, what they've pulled out down off the internet, but what they actually see. They can share their actual perspective. And it's this optimism around this sort of distributed networked camera and its potential that led myself and my co-founder, Casey Neistat, uh, to form a company called Beam. So quick Beam demo. Uh, so Beam is a platform that is about turning this device into as raw a sharing platform as possible, to using this camera in the most sort of native possible way. So when you share on Beam, instead of looking at your device and editing, uh, all you need to do is this. So I'm going to show the tens of thousands of people following me what it's like to be on stage right now, what it's like to be me. And to do that, I just go like this. Say hello. <laughs> and as soon as I pull my phone away, that clip has been shared. If I want to add a little context, hey, I'm on stage in Malmo talking about empathy and video. It goes back in my pocket. No opportunity to preview, to review, to edit. All of that is shared instantly. And I'm not here to sell you on Beam. I'm here to just talk about this potential. So this is one possible incarnation of the use of this sensor. And I think it's easy to see me as the founder of a company and dismiss this optimism and go, yeah, you know, that's, you're hoping you're going to be successful and you're counting on this, this sensor to do this thing and the sensor to really increase empathy in the way you're talking about. But the data and the science actually back me up here. So if you look at global mobile video traffic, in 2012 to 2016, it's increased five times. So five times the amount of traffic is video. And Ericsson is currently predicting, and the number was so high that I couldn't even fit it on this chart, Ericsson is currently predicting the video traffic in 2020 will be 10 times what it is today. So 5x in the last four years, 10x the current value in four more years. So video is this tidal wave. And I think if you take one thing away from this talk, it is that you have to be thinking about video now because these numbers are going up exponentially and consumers and citizens are going to be expecting video very soon. But more than just the fact that video is going to be ubiquitous, I actually have looked into some of the psychological studies around video and they show that video can actually increase empathy in an objectively measured way. So there are a couple of studies um, and they're mostly in developmental psychology uh, looking at education. Um, but there are a couple of studies in education that 
pulled groups apart and separated one group that was taught with just video and one with just text. So one of these groups were first year medical students who were learning about blood disorders. And one group was taught purely with text, sort of classic seminar style. The other group was taught with a mix of text and video. And the study showed that the group that was taught with text and video had more empathy for their patients, had more empathy for the families of people who were going through the, the problems related to these blood disorders. And there was a second study that was done with special, special education teachers in training. So people who are learning to be teachers to students with special needs. And uh, this is the same sort of experiment. Half the group was taught with only text. The other half was taught with text and video. And the group that was taught with text and video again showed on an objective, there's actually a, a psychological test, I think it's like the Jefferson empathy test. Um, but there's an index of empathy and they showed again that the group that was taught with video had more empathy for students and had more ability to sort of understand their perspective when they were taught with video. Uh, so this, this potential is not just uh, something that I, I, I'm sort of imagining as I see these sensors and as someone who's made a big bet on them, uh, this potential in video to see empathy increase as scale increase is real. Now, a lot of you, I imagine, when I say you have to be thinking about video, are thinking that's really expensive, that requires a lot of planning, that requires production. We don't have the capacity to do any of that. And what I think is really exciting about this sort of revolution that's going on right now is that you don't have to have any of those things. You don't have to have a budget. You don't have to, to have extensive planning. You don't have to have extensive staff to create. And whether it's Beam or Facebook Live or Snapchat, all of these platforms allow for a sort of raw kind of sharing uh, that users will really forgive a lot in the way of production values and you can really, really get started on today. And I think this sort of revolution that we're in the midst of is incredibly exciting because it means that there is finally this potential for social software, these things that I build and so many people in this room use, to actually scale up in empathy as they scale up in users. And I think we can finally get past this era where we're hitting this funny little like button to say, I empathize, I get it. And if we want to say we like something, just look at your phone and say, hey, I really like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matt. I find it a bit sad that we don't post things we, we are afraid won't get liked. Right? Yeah. At least privately, maybe not for a company. It's funny though, so I, I once overheard a conversation on the subway, which I think really characterized this problem incredibly well. And I'd never heard this term before, but basically the, the guy was saying, you know, it's like two sort of bro -y guys talking to each other. Uh, and he said, yo man, you didn't even get into the numbers on that post. And I was like, what, what does that mean? And it finally occurred to me that on Instagram, when you have more than 10 likes, yeah. it turns into a number. And he was saying like, how could you even post if you're not going to get more than 10 likes? That's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> if you talk to a teenager, I have one, uh, several, uh, and uh, they really know that. Then the, it's a big, big uh, failure if you don't get through the numbers. But I was thinking, um, you do have some tough competition mm -hmm. for Beam <laughs> with Facebook Live. How are you going to handle that competition? Yeah, it's interesting. So I think we're, we're really not in the live space. Um, and this is something that, that is all being defined right now. I think people uh, are searching for terms in this. And I don't know that we have our own term exactly. But, you know, Beam is sort of near real time. But it gets over a lot of the, the difficulties that you have in live in there's something really exciting that happens in minute 17. But the first 17 minutes are fumbling with the camera, getting everything set up, the context, and waiting. Um, and Beam is about being able to distill that to its quick little moments. So, you know, I can share something at the beginning, eight second clip, share something in the middle with a little more context, eight second clip, and then share the, the sort of big crescendo, four second clip. Uh, and that gets cut in automatically into one little video. 
uh, and I don't have to sit around and wait for 17 minutes. Mm. Um, another thing I was thinking about is with Beam and, and other uh, apps that function the same way, there is a risk that you will film people that won't like it or, or don't want to be filmed. What, what's your... Yeah, this is really interesting. This is something that I, uh, I hear a lot more in Europe than in the States. I mean, yeah. I think the, the norms... What, how come, do you think? I just think the norms are very different. I think the, the, the way that people share and think about sharing in the US tends to be less privacy centric. And I, you know, I think that's just a, a cultural thing. I'm not quite sure what the source yeah. of that is. Um, you know, that said, I, I think this is something we're going to be dealing with across all of society. And the platforms obviously, obviously have to be part of the conversation, but this idea of privacy in the classic sense, and really, you know, the idea of privacy in the classic sense is only a 19th century idea. It's relatively new. It emerged as more and more people were moving to cities and this idea of private and public life emerged. It's just going to change. I think how we, well, what we think about privacy, what we think about when it's okay to record or not, is just it's going to be a, a tense conversation. Um, and, you know, I think for Beam, what we, what we really focused on was having community guidelines that make it really clear that you can't use the platform to make people uncomfortable. And I forget the language we use exactly, but, you know, even before we launched, we put language in there that, that said, you know, if you're, uh, if you're using Beam to clandestinely record, the content will be removed and your account will be deleted because we really, really don't want that uh, sort of, you know, sneaky posting. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really, it's a dense, complicated conversation that I think we're all going to be having for a while. Mm. Sophia, do we have any comments or do you have any thoughts or questions? Uh, I have a thought here from someone in the audience. Um, um, this person writes, I, I always thought of social media as a public correction of people's behavior. <laughs> uh, no likes means that people do not approve of it. <laughs> Any thoughts on that comment, maybe? That's really funny. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I really... So, so to me, that, that's not quite... The public correction of behavior isn't quite the potential of these platforms. Like, you know, it can be, and you see this in the, the there are lots of conversations around sort of the, the ways you can get mauled on Twitter by making the wrong kind of comment. And that's, that's uh, a public correction in the opposite direction with quite a lot of noise. Um, but no, I mean, I, I, I really do think, I sort of fundamentally believe that, that being able to share in a way that doesn't involve extensive self-censorship and being able to find platforms where that is possible uh, is really important and really good for our society. Um, so, yeah, I don't, I, I, I think that, you know, that person would probably pull it back down if they got no likes, which I think is, is kind of sad because obviously it meant something to them that they shared it. Yeah. Um, that that is it's interesting the the development with the Facebook reaction buttons because it obviously it was not enough to have the like uh, you have to react in many ways. Yeah, and I think yeah. this is you're going to see all the platforms try in various ways because it that that like that sort of gesture which really you know it, it sounds sort of cheesy but I do think in 2008 2009 we were just having the conversations about these features it was a really exciting thing it was yeah. it had real potential and man we've lost that in a big way. Mm. Okay. Right. Thank you so much Matt. Thank you. Oh, and you know you have to tell us why did the fans take a selfie with you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so my co-founder is a guy named Casey Neistat. Um, he has a daily vlog, which is one of the, the fastest growing channels on YouTube. Um, and, you know, we use it uh, to talk about the company a lot. And obviously a big part of his life is this company that he is co-founder of. And so I am like a, a minor he lets occasional you be in cameo yeah. in this, uh, which has resulted in sort of fans all over the world. Although it's interesting because Beam is taking on its own life too. And these, these, these kids came up to me and wanted to take a Beam first and then a selfie. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so all much. All right. Thank you.